Hey guys, welcome back. So we've got a couple really uh, dynamic keynote uh, presenters for you. The first one is uh, Stephen Orban. And Stephen is the global head of enterprise strategy at uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS. He joined AWS as uh, head of enterprise strategy in 2014 in September. Uh, in this role, Stephen is really working with enterprise technology executives to share experiences and strategies for how the cloud uh, enables business results, accelerates innovation, lowers cost, and streamlines processes. Uh, prior to joining AWS, Stephen was the CIO of Dow Jones. We introduced modern software development methodologies, reduced cost, and administered a uh, cloud-first policy by leveraging AWS and other SaaS partners. Uh, these transformational changes accelerated product development cycles and increased productivity across all lines of business, including the Wall Street Journal, MarketWatch.com, uh, Dow Jones, Newswires, and Factiva. Uh, Stevens also spent 11 years at Bloomberg LP, holding a variety of leadership positions across their equity and messaging platforms before uh, founding Bloomberg Sports in 2008, where he served as uh, CTO. Stephen earned his bachelor's degree in computer science from State University of New York College at Fredonia. So it gives me great pleasure, and please help me in uh, welcoming Stephen to the stage. Thank you, Joe and Apti, for having me here with you today. I'm very excited and happy to be here, though perhaps not as happy as my wife is, who's delighted to know that I'm spending some time with you today instead of being parked in front of the craps, craps table all morning. So if you think about enterprise IT today, it tends to have well-established and sometimes functional storage systems, network topology, compute virtualization, and governance models that all need to be thought about in a slightly different way in a world where there's infinitely scalable and globally available IT resources now at your disposal. Now, as more companies realize this, they're also beginning to understand that running their own infrastructure typically does not help them meet their business objectives. So over the course of the next half hour or so, what I hope to help everybody understand is how the cloud can help you meet your business objectives at a pace that you're comfortable with, that will accelerate over time, and that will allow you to take advantage of your existing investments along the way. So before that, I'll give you a little bit about my background. As Joe said, I spent seven years, I started my career at Bloomberg, and I spent seven years through a variety of leadership and development positions across their equity and messaging platforms before in 2008, when the markets took a nosedive, Bloomberg began to invest in a bunch of new businesses to diversify their revenue streams into the company. And I had the opportunity to get together with several folks who I had worked with in the past. And we had this hypothesis that if we treated a professional uh, athlete like an equity and a professional sports team like a portfolio, we could build the same kind of analytics that Bloomberg had built on top of data for financial services under the rich amount of data that's now collected in professional sports and help professional sports teams manage their operations more effectively. And so Bloomberg Sports was founded. And we had a great run developing that business over the course of the, uh, the next three or four years or so. And Bloomberg made about 15 or 16 similar such investments in different industries, Bloomberg Law, Bloomberg Real Estate, Bloomberg Government. And as they made these types of investments, we realized very quickly that we were really crummy at running infrastructure for a bunch of startup businesses when we tried to adopt the same methodologies that we had for a mature business like the Bloomberg Terminal. And we were spending literally tens of millions of dollars on infrastructure and making those businesses far less attractive investments than they should have been. So in 2011, I was asked to do something about this and we developed a private cloud to create efficiencies across all these different business arms. Now, on one hand, we did make the cost much more attractive, and we were moving much faster than we had before. But on the other, we were still moving much more slowly than if we had just taken it, looked to take advantage of the pace of innovation that AWS had brought to market. And all of my customers, who were the CTOs of these different business units, were still relatively ha unhappy. Everybody felt that we would be much more nimble and we would be much better served by devoting our resources to the, the product development activities rather than developing our own infrastructure. So I realized that we would never be able to keep up with commercial vendors and resigned to the idea that, that building our own private cloud was not a good use of our resources. 
So when I became the CIO of Dow Jones in 2012, I knew not to make the same mistake. So over the course of this morning, I'll, I'll talk about some of my Dow Jones experiences, but I'll start by saying that last year, I had a, a very distinct moment of clarity. It became so obvious to me that companies should not be spending their scarce resources on activities like managing infrastructure that don't drive revenue into the business. So in 2012, when we started our cloud journey at Dow Jones, we had an awful lot of skeptics, both internally and externally, who thought that we were relatively crazy for trying to use the cloud in a serious way to power a large enterprise. We not only proved them wrong, but we surpassed even our own expectations. What we were able, what we were able to accomplish because, largely because of AWS, was nothing short of transformational. We went from 70% of the resources in my department focused on IT operations to 70% of our resources focused on product development while reducing my budget each and every year. I won't claim that things were perfect in technology and IT. They very rarely are. But they were certainly much better um, than they were before we had started. So now I feel like I have the best job in the world. I get to take my experiences transforming IT in a large enterprise using AWS, combine them with the experiences of other executives that I talk to, and help IT executives all over the world be successful in transforming their business using the cloud. Now what I'm seeing as every company uh, starts to unlock the business benefit that the cloud brings to their business, they find themselves having to answer one very important question. What if you could devote 30% more of your resources to your business? This question will certainly have a different answer depending on your business or industry or your role, but it is often the key driver in what is propelling companies to broaden their adoption of cloud services. So you've already heard a lot about this, and you'll hear more about it over the course of the week, about this concept of digital transformation. And I'd argue that the cloud is the key enabler for these transformations taking place because it's allowing companies to focus on what matters most to their business. So I'd like everybody to keep this in mind as I move through our discussion this morning, because as it becomes clear how you'll be able to realize this benefit, you're going to need to be able to think about what you'll do with those resources. So when I was a CIO, I tended to look at my department as having five different parts. We were always tweaking the department to best meet the needs of the business, but I always came back to this view when thinking about how to optimally split resources across a large and global IT footprint. So on the one side, you have your business applications. These are the technologies that drive revenue into the business. It's your digital products, your point of sale systems, your e-commerce systems, and so on. Next to that, you have your corporate applications. Sometimes people refer to this as back office. Things like email, productivity, ERP, legal, other financial applications. Next to that, you have end user computing, uh, commonly known maybe as IT support. We have desktop support, mobile device management, uh, telephony, that sort of thing. Underneath that, which tends to be centralized across those three parts I just mentioned, is infrastructure, where you have data centers, networks, storage, uh, and the like. And in today's day and age, infused in everything we do at this point is information security and how you keep all of that information and all of your data uh, safe. So let's think about for a second why infrastructure is so commonly centralized in a traditional IT outlay. Well, my, my, my uh, feeling on this is because infrastructure is historically expensive, it's slow, and it requires a great deal of expertise to do well at scale. So historically, it's even easier to abstract these complexities away from the other parts of the business because it's so hard to do well at scale. Then compare that to where your customers want you spending most of your time. And compare that to where your executive team wants you spending most of your time. And I hope that answer is on growing and improving the business. Now, the other areas are all very important, and not doing them well can certainly hurt your business, but doing them marginally better than the competition is not likely going to materially improve your results. So Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder and CEO, often talks about how in business it's useful 
to think about the things that are constant. Everybody always talks about the things that are going to change. Technology is among them. But you don't often hear the business community talk about the things that don't change. And when you hear Jeff talk about some of the customer obsession philosophies that have helped make Amazon.com so successful, you'll hear Jeff say things like, it's impossible for him to imagine a future where customers of Amazon.com want to pay more for their items. And it's impossible to imagine a future where customers of Amazon.com want their items delivered to them more slowly. So we think about these things the same way at AWS. What are the chances that your customers come to you and say that they want you to spend your time, more of your time, building infrastructure rather than delivering the products that they pay you for? What's the possibility that your CEO comes to you and say, gee, I really wish you would spend more time managing our email services than you do on developing your products. It's just impossible to imagine a world where these conversations are happening. So a little bit about uh, how AWS has innovated over the course of the past several years uh, and how we now have solutions that cut across nearly every part of IT. Our early services were, were very well suited for infrastructure and security, but as we've listened to customers and we've helped companies become more efficient in these parts, we've also learned that many companies still feel like they spend too much time on the undifferentiated heavy lifting in other parts of IT. So through listening to these customers, we've developed a number of solutions that cut across a number of additional parts in a traditional IT environment. In the corporate application space, we now have WorkDocs, which lets you share files across your, uh, your organization. WorkMail is a secure and exchange-compatible mail server that runs in the cloud that allows you to control where your content and your data resides. And end user computing, we have workspaces, which allows you to manage desktops for your workforce in the cloud. Imagine a world where just for a few dollars a month and a click of a button, you can get a more powerful desktop for anybody in your organization. Uh, in the information security space, we continue to, uh, uh, to work to innovate to provide you with the most trusted and secure platform and are constantly adding features and certifications that make it easier for you to deploy uh, your most complex and sensitive workloads. And on top of this, the AWS Marketplace has thousands of solutions across every part of IT. We've taken the same concept that's helped Amazon.com exponentially grow its product inventory and allowed technology vendors to sell their AWS-compatible solutions in the Marketplace. This gives you, our customers, a broad selection of solutions that they can deploy in seconds into their infrastructure. We also have the AWS Service Catalog, which we announced uh, six or eight months ago or so, which allows IT administrators to manage what services and applications can be consumed by whom across the rest of your organization. This allows enterprises to maintain standards and governance and compliance across a large and distributed workforce. And in addition to the services that we offer, there are a number of credible IT, enterprise IT vendors who are now developing cloud-based offerings like AppDynamics that are helping organizations shift their focus to what matters most to their business. We think that this growing industry is great for, this growing industry is great for the industry because it helps customers learn how to integrate cloud solutions, but it's also great for us because it keeps us hungry to innovate for your business. So what I hope that this picture illustrates is that AWS can help make your entire IT organization more effective. It means that you can start taking advantage of cloud anywhere in your organization. It should be driven by the needs of your business at that time. And once you start to realize the benefits in one part of your IT organization, chances are you'll be able to leverage that experience to move across other parts as well. And now we've seen this happen in a number of organizations and a wide variety of customers, many of whom already have long-standing and mature IT organizations. In the media space, you have my alma mater, Dow Jones and News Corp, who became cloud first and is migrating the majority of their data centers to the cloud. Condé Nast, Hearst, Fairfax Media are several companies who are following a similar path. In healthcare, Johnson & Johnson is using AWS to deploy workspace desktops for tens of thousands of contractors to work in their environment without ever having to manage a single device. Merck is using us to operate DevOps across a growing number of their businesses. 
In the travel industry, Qantas is using AWS to enhance their customer loyalty programs and dynamically compute f flight paths. And financial services, Intuit, Suncorp, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, and many others are using AWS in a big way to modernize their IT environments and focus more of their resources into their business. When it comes down to it, every imaginable business segment at this point is using AWS in a meaningful way. So we're also very fortunate enough to have built a pretty large public sector business. We've got more than 1,600 government agencies around the world who are using AWS to quickly procure and manage their IT assets, as well as reduce deployment costs by several orders of magnitude. Now, many of these government agencies are enjoying the benefit of having a common infrastructure across agencies so that they can benefit from a broader public sector community. The AWS marketplace is another avenue that's allowing them to collaborate on package solutions and procure solutions from thousands of technology vendors all through AWS, which has drastically re reduced their oftentimes very bureaucratic procurement processes. In addition to these uh, public sector customers, there's over 3,600 educational institutions that are using AWS not just for their IT, but many are starting to include AWS programs in their curriculum as students are using AWS to develop their projects and learn about how to use it before they matriculate into the workforce. So let's talk about what's going to happen to this view of IT as companies start to adopt more and more cloud technologies. This is going to be slightly different depending on every organization, but this is broadly the trend that we're seeing in organizations who do this well. End user computing and corporate applications need to rely less and less on infrastructure as the solutions that are powering those parts of IT are increasingly run on the cloud. This is allowing companies to focus on optimizing the business processes associated with these parts of IT rather than the infrastructure underneath to manage it. DevOps, or some other aptly named cloud center of excellence, is emerging as a much more cost-effective way, and agile way to provide best practices, governance, and automation across all the rest of IT. This transition, which is often, as we're seeing, assisted with the AppDynamic suite of tools, frees up the precious resources for companies to focus more of their resources on what matters most to their business. So I'd once again ask everybody, I'd encourage everybody to ask themselves, what would you do if you had more resources to devote to your business? I've been very fortunate over the course of the last year and a half or so, I've talked to well over 100 CIOs from enterprises all over the world, and this is what many of them, at the end of the day, are really after. Everybody comes in for different reasons. Yes, the cloud can help you save money. Yes, it can help you go global faster. Yes, it can make you more agile. Yes, it can potentially make you more secure. <clears throat> but what AWS brings to large and established organizations is the freedom from the undifferentiated heavy lifting that's traditionally associated with IT. So the question then becomes how? So that's great that this is happening, but what are the things that companies are doing to enable this transition? So I'll spend the rest of that, my time this morning talking about, uh, talking about what we call the journey. Now this is not something that's gonna happen overnight. It's an iterative process that involves thinking about IT a little bit differently, but one that definitely becomes easier over time and as you make progress. The destination, which is to divert more of your resources back to your customers, will start to happen right away and pick up speed as you gain experience. We've seen this take place a number of times now. I've lived it at Dow Jones and News Corp, the weather company, Hess, Qantas, Samsung, Hearst, and thousands of others are, are well on their way as well. And through these experiences, we've observed a common set of practices that each organization has employed along the way. And these best practices illustrate the handful of areas that companies are investing their energy in to, get, to, get, to help them get the most out of the cloud, which in turn allows them to focus more of their resources back to their business. So the first of these best practices is that they provide executive sponsorship and top-down leadership. So it's very simple. Projects in big companies are far more likely to succeed when the boss supports them. Next, they provide opportunities for their staff to learn. Our computer science fundamentals have not changed. If anything, the cloud has just made them easier for more people to work with. 
everybody who wants to learn can transfer their skills to the cloud and continue to be successful. The cost of experimentation in the cloud pales in comparison to traditional on-premises environments. You'll be able to learn and get things done more quickly, and you'll be more successful when, you'll view, when you start to view your new initiatives as experiments that will provide valuable insight into how the organization can work moving forward. Now, right around these three practices is where, you know, unfortunately, I see uh, many organizations get stuck. You start doing these three things, but to get to the next level, you really have to make an investment and a serious commitment to your organization to make it real. And so the, the, next, the, the next set of things are the things that you have to do while you continue to invest in these three practices. So the ecosystem of system integrators, digital consultancies, and IT vendors that are delivering cloud-based solutions has evolved, frankly, has exploded quite a bit in the last several years. AppDynamics is a perfect example of this. They founded in 2008, and they've already become one of the most meaningful enterprise IT vendors on the scene. And it's amazing to see so many people here at the, uh, at the conference today. So whether or not you'd like to work directly with a partner or indirectly through the AWS marketplace, there's plenty of opportunities for you to accelerate your initiatives on the AWS platform through the partner ecosystem. Next, they create a cloud center of excellence. So what I did at Dow Jones was to create a DevOps organization. I see many companies following a similar suit. But what you call this and where it sits in your organization is far less important than its mission and the executive support that it receives. And of course, most large IT organizations, most large organizations have large existing IT footprints that haven't yet fulfilled their useful life. So setting up a hybrid IT architecture allows customers to take full advantage of what the cloud has to offer while still taking advantage of their existing assets. And finally, when an organization realizes the full benefits that cloud has to offer, <clears throat> they end up instituting a cloud-first standard. And typically what this means is that they reverse the burden of proof for all of the initiatives in their organization away from why cloud for all their projects to why not cloud for all their projects. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. Like I said before, projects in big companies are far more likely to succeed when the boss supports them. You certainly don't need to bet the farm in the first few months, but you want to start with something that's important enough to get the attention of the executive team. If you're in an executive or a leadership position, help the organization understand the long game and then celebrate successes along the way. When I was at Dow Jones, I used every opportunity I could to reinforce our cloud strategy. In executive meetings, during town halls, on my blog, and every other outlet that presented itself. Making it clear to your teams why this is important to your business will be key in winning everybody over. If you're not in a position to make the decision, help your leadership team understand that they'll be able to devote more of their resources to their business. And oftentimes we see that this is the case. It comes from within teams who are eager to, to develop something new. And oftentimes I see it's best to illustrate this with a case study and show that it could scale what you've done if there, was initial, uh, if there was additional investment into moving in that direction. Next, think about how you can appeal to your stakeholders. Try to understand what motivates your executive team. Again, this is going to be different in every company, but some patterns that we've seen is you know, most CEOs want a competitive edge, and they want to look for ways to keep, not surprisingly, their resources focused on their business. Most CIOs really want to be aligned to business needs, and they want to be able to move quickly and efficiently as they move on their journey. Most CFOs, again, not surprisingly, they want to save money. Not only can the cloud save you money, but it can also help you greatly increase cash flows when you don't have to make substantial capital investments for every project that you want to try. Marketers want to be able to quickly re respond to changing market conditions, quickly update their branded websites, and have access to better analytics. Uh, Amazon Redshift, which is AWS's fastest growing service, has helped many of our customers reduce the time and complexity that's traditionally associated with enterprise IT data warehousing. Unilever's marketing team uses AWS to host over 1,700 of their brand websites and can't understand how they ever lived with the change cadence that they had uh, before they moved to AWS. Security officers want greater visibility into the IT platform 
and have controls that they can broadly apply to the entire environment. Using tools like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and AWS Config, our customers can audit and alert on their entire IT environment in one single API call. Next, you should be open-minded about investing uh, and making an investment in your staff skills. Now, I sometimes hear that organizations are a little apprehensive about moving forward because they don't feel that they have the right skill sets in their organization. I don't think that this is the right way to look at, look at it. Anyone who is willing to learn can participate in helping move your organization forward. Basic computer science fundamentals have not changed. And most companies that embrace the idea of giving their staff new skills not only move a lot faster, but also can use it as a uh, I can use their cloud strategy as a mechanism to attract and retain talent. So this chart that I pulled off uh, uh, job trends from Indeed shows the growing trend for job postings that lists AWS somewhere in the job description. This is a great ind indicator of what the industry is after and I think a leading indicator of the further growth of the AWS platform. Now, it's good for you to know as an employer that the skills, that the investments you're making in your staff skills will continue to pay off. And as employees, it's great to know that the investment in your career is going to continue to help you for many years to come. Like all the practices in the journey that we're talking about, the more you invest in this area or the more internal champions that you build, the faster your journey will accelerate. So we offer a wide variety of training courses that are both self-service and instructor-led to help you on your journey. And on top of this, we provide several certification programs that will give you and your workforce the confidence and peace of mind that you're using our systems in the right way as you implement your own systems. We offer courses that not only go deep on the technology stack, but also help the business understand the benefits of cloud computing so that they can partner effectively with you on your journey. Now, when I was at Dow Jones, we trained my entire staff on training on the AWS fundamentals right out of the gate. And while we certainly did hire many new people, much of what we accomplished was because the well-tenured folks became willing to learn and acquire new skills and push their careers and our agendas forward. Next, let's start to look at each of your projects as an experiment. So I think this is important in the beginning but it's also a real opportunity for companies to change the way they think about project portfolio management. Because the investment required to try new things is far less than if you had to procure, manage, and deploy infrastructure, it becomes much easier to justify and start new projects. Even if the things that you experiment with don't necessarily work out the way you, you intended, you're almost certainly gonna build some expertise that you can parlay into your next project uh, and continue to help you move forward. And as the cloud muscle memory in your organization grows and you build confidence off of each experiment, you're going to be able to move a lot more quickly and be much more, um, much more able to change directions. So we saw on the uh, IT map that AWS has a number of services that can um, uh, fit in anywhere in your IT environment. This means that you can start anywhere. And I always encourage companies to look for a place to experiment where they already need to make an investment. Maybe you want to try an SAP implementation to compare performance and costs. Maybe you want to build a website or a mobile app. Maybe you want to try virtual desktops to help scale out your staff. The possibilities really at the end of the day are endless. And because most of our, all of our services are pay as you go, many of which have free tiers, it's very easy and cost effective to try. What's important is that you view these experiments as an educational process that will allow to focus more of your resources on delivering results for the business. So let's start to look at how the journey unfolds as it relates to your existing investments. On one hand, you have your data center, which is full of storage, networking, and everybody's age-old friend, uh, and my personal favorite, the mainframe, which is over there on the left. We kept a plastic dinosaur on top of ours. Um, and working uh, alongside these assets are the staff that brings all your, all your uh, IT infrastructure to life. On the other hand, you have the cloud. Will you be able to experiment with little to no upfront costs and a small team of people? The beauty of this scenario is that you're starting with a business problem that you already had, 
and you're able to leverage the staff that you already have. And since you don't have to procure infrastructure, you're likely to avoid upfront costs and hopefully shorten the debate about whether or not this experiment is worth pursuing. Most companies I speak to find that it doesn't take many experiments before they start to realize some of these benefits, which allows them to focus their efforts now on which experiments to choose rather than be overwhelmed with how to proceed in a large portfolio of projects. So a lot of our customers leverage third parties on to help them on their journey. Now, some of these come through pre-existing relationships, and sometimes our customers have worked with us to, or went out to market to help them find new partners, to help them meet their new needs. There's a rich, growing ecosystem of consulting partners that are available to help. There's an exploding uh, ecosystem of born-in-the-cloud uh, vendors like CloudReach, Second Watch, and Minjar. But there's also all of the major consulting firms at this point are building their own cloud practices and helping their customers understand what the cloud means to them. This includes many of the SIs that most of you in the room probably already work with, such as Accenture, Capgemini, Wipro, Cognizant, and several others. And of course, there's also a very rich set of third-party tools that are available to help companies manage their IT environments. Similar to the consulting partners, many of them are born in the cloud, but there's also a growing number of traditional IT vendors, folks like Riverbed and SAP, who are making big bets to make their solutions available in a cloud-friendly way. And of course, AppDynamics, which is the reason we're all here, is playing a very important role in helping thousands of IT organizations take advantage of everything that the cloud has to offer. So you saw this slide earlier today, but so I won't spend too much time on it, but we're seeing that the AppD monitoring platform gives customers and enterprises complete visibility into both their on-premises and AWS environments, which makes it very easy for you to determine what type of instance types you need and how you should be taking advantage of auto-scaling, which will allow you to quickly optimize your AWS deployments as you migrate more of your systems to the cloud. In addition to this, we've seen that AppD, our customers have told us that AppD is incredibly easy to set up, seamlessly monitors your system as they grow and, and maybe even more importantly shrinks, automatically baselines performance once you integrate with things like AWS CloudTrail, uh, CloudWatch and the like. And it also allows you to drill very deep into the details uh, on, on all of your business services. So it's been my experience that there's a necessary friction between application and infrastructure teams. And I think oftentimes, uh, J Jody talked about this a little earlier today, oftentimes this system of checks and balances can be healthy, but sometimes this can also become toxic. Now because the cloud takes away a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting, the lines between app teams and infrastructure teams can get even more blurred. And what we found is that customers who develop a cloud center of excellence to drive best practices, governance, and automation through their organization get much more out of their cloud investments than those who don't. DevOps is a really common name for this group, though having the group is much more important than what you call it. When we created our DevOps uh, organization at Dow Jones, we had three key requirements. One was that they were gonna be customer service oriented. I wanted everybody to come to me and tell me what a pleasure it was to work with DevOps, and they're gonna go back and work with them because they want to, not because I'm forcing them. The second was that they had to automate everything. It's pretty well understood at this point that automation is, a lot, is what allows you to get uh, the most of what cloud has to offer. And the third is what they would become a non-blocking centralized resource. So they would enable all of the different business units to get up and running with their, with their IT running in the cloud, but then they would get out of the critical path and leave the business teams and the business units responsible for the ongoing operations of their systems. And what we found, and what, I, what I'm seeing, is as you build your inventory of skills and automation through your cloud center of excellence, you'll be able to use them across a growing portfolio of projects and start to deliver results much faster. So what's going to happen as your center of excellence gains uh, traction? As you gain experience and you start to leverage the pieces of automation that you built over time, you'll be able to move more quickly and accomplish more with less resources. At this point, you're going to start to see the true value of the cloud, and in my experience, it doesn't take long before you're now able to start devoting more and more of your resources to the projects that move your business forward. So at Dow Jones, again, this was not something that we did overnight. 
It was a deliberate exercise and one in which we moved people around the department and gave everybody new opportunities with different business units and everybody had an opportunity to work on new initiatives that drove the business forward. So now at some point, you're going to find that you need your cloud applications to communicate with the environments that you run in your data center. AWS's virtual private cloud offers a straightforward way for you to establish secure connectivity between your on-premises resources and the cloud and allow you to communicate privately be between the two. On top of that, we have a number of security solutions like our key management service and Cloud HSM, or you can bring your own that allows you to make sure that your communications and data is encrypted. This can help you achieve the security posturing you need knowing that the data center and infrastructure underneath is being secured by a world-class team of engineers and leveraging the improvements that we're making for over a million customers all around the world. Once you have this set up, you'll be able to move even faster. Coupled with the exp expertise that comes from your Cloud Center of Excellence, mission-critical applications that maybe you never thought possible will be able to move perhaps piece by piece. At the same time, we find that many customers are able to start adding features that they've wanted to for years but never had the time or the resources to do. When we were at Dow Jones and we had to first set up our VPC, um, we, uh, uh, we, had this, uh, um, uh, uh, we had this issue where we had to move all of the instances that were running in the public internet into our VPC, and you had to terminate and, and re-bring up the instances so that you could get IP addresses within the new subnet. And the engineers on my team went and looked at you know, all the documentation for how they would use automation to do this, went back to their desks, and literally in 30 minutes, we migrated an entire data center's worth, about 40 or 50 uh, instances, with zero downtime and not having to buy anything new, which is not something you're ever going to be able to achieve um, within your own on-premises environments. And at this point, you're likely steering away from substantial hardware purchases and maybe even migrating big pieces of your mainframe to services that are now optimized to run in the cloud. And most importantly, this is where I start to see companies get real meaningful returns on their investments as they start to devote serious resources back to their business. So last, on the cloud-first standards, it's, it's this point where companies reach a tipping point. They've begun to embrace cloud technologies in a number of their different businesses and have become more efficient at operating in the cloud than they have in their on-premise environments. And this is how the cloud has become the new normal. Now they're able to gain tremendous efficiencies across all of their projects, accomplishing more with less, and often eliminating traditional infrastructure procurement cycles. So these are a handful of customers who have been through this journey and have made cloud-first uh, declarations for their business. And one of my absolute favorite quotes comes from Charles Phillips, the CEO of Infor, who was very recently quoted as saying, friends don't let friends build data centers. I'm very happy to be working with Charles and his team. Uh, and up until this point, most of your initiatives will likely have been driven by business needs. But eventually, we're seeing that companies become so much more efficient in implementing their systems in the cloud that the migration of entire data centers becomes an attractive business case. So to help you with that, AWS has 11 regions all around the world with several more uh, that we've announced that are coming, which should help you serve your customers regardless of where you are. If you're experimenting in the United States, you'll likely start to uh, experiment with Virginia and Oregon, and you'll get the advantage of being able to disperse applications with lower latency for users, while at the same time creating higher availability for your customers. Then having your applications automated allows you to easily expand geographically. We were able to migrate uh, at Dow Jones applications for the Wall Street Journal and Market Watch in just a few days' time to uh, other regions all around the world while shutting down several satellite data centers in the process. And this is going to continue as you migrate throughout your journey. Condé Nast is another good example. They migrated all of their corporate applications, shut down their primary data center in New Jersey, uh, and, and saved a significant amount of money um, in the process. And we found that this actually works in the other way as well. Hess is, the oil and as an oil and gas company, and 
they decided that they wanted to divest about 40 or so of their business units. They had their center of excellence move those assets to AWS and the divestiture meeting for the handover of the IT assets was literally a 30 minute meeting where they handed over the AWS keys to the acquiring company. And so finally, I'll wrap up just by closing uh, to make sure that all of you know that our host here at App, App Dynamics is one of the most, it has a suite of one of the most effective tools to help you manage your data center migration efforts. So in addition to the tools that we offer, and we announced many of them at our, our conference two months ago, the AWS database migration service, Snowball, VM import, and others, we're finding that um, App Dynamics is helping a lot of companies migrate their data centers to AWS. It allows you, their platform allows you to discover what's going on in your data centers so you know how to optimize your target architecture on the cloud. It's also going to give you a number of different uh, performance baselines over a number of different vectors, which allows you to dive into the details of each transaction that you see on your system. And finally, once you migrate your application, these tools allow you to easily compare KPIs across the two environments, which is a feat that very few other tools can claim. So with that, I'd like to thank APD again for having me uh, this morning, and thank you very much for your time. If you liked anything that I talked about, you can follow my blog or follow me on Twitter uh, to learn more about AWS's perspective on the enterprise, and enjoy Vegas.